Dave Tilly, what's up, man? Welcome back. Pumped to shoot the shit again. Yeah, man. Ryan, how are you, buddy? Yeah, round two. I feel like our first chat was uh was like a year and a half, two years ago, maybe yeah. something like that. Yeah. And uh good good timing for that one. You know, we were in the thick of a lot of stuff and then you know, the world has continued in its own way and gymnastics is, is rolling along. And so probably good to catch up again and, and hang out, you know? Yeah, for sure. That, well, that that's why even I reached out again is like, I know you had a bunch of stuff going on. Um, You got your event uh, happening over the summer. I saw you, I guess, is it a book? Is that what you got going on? I'm, yep. I'm honestly, that's really what I want to jam out about a little bit and just kind of hear how the event went this summer, how that's going, kind of what your vision is uh, for it moving forward, things like that. And then just, yeah, just jam about your book a little bit too. Yeah, man. So we did our second symposium in June and, uh, you know, it's, it's cool because I think we can tap, we can tap into a very wide audience of presenters and, uh, you know, viewers. So we started organizing that last February and just tried to see like, you know, over three days, how many smart, interesting, you know, useful people can we get? And we essentially yeah. had an entire curriculum around what people wanted. So we put surveys out and said like, what do you need the most help with? And then obviously we tried to, you know, dove, dovetail or kind of stitch together what we didn't hit in the last year. So we didn't want to repeat a ton of new topics, right. um, but we essentially tried to weave between, okay, what didn't we get last time? What new speakers? We tried our best to really refresh most of the panel. Um, no offense to anyone who didn't get a second invite back, but um, <laughs> we wanted to try our best to get a lot of new faces uh, and kind of get some new perspectives and stuff. So yeah, I mean, we worked for like six months on that and um, it, it went off very well. I think it was uh, very well recepted. People enjoyed it quite a bit. I think it ended up being like, you know, probably uh, was it 18, 18 to 20 hours worth of, of of contact time and people enjoyed it quite a bit. So it went well. And then to be honest, I mean, uh, Shift hit uh, its 10 year anniversary uh, in Kudos. September. Yeah, thank you. In September. But, you know, after six months of getting ready for the symposium and like, you know, managing a team. I had two people that were working for shift. Um, it's just, it's so much, man. It's so much to run those events and run a company and do all that kind of stuff. And yeah, just like over the summer after that, like I, I got, I don't want to say burnt out is the word. I want to say like, I started to re like get a little like exhausted and kind of yeah. tired and like evaluate like, all right, 10 years, we've been just grinding nonstop. Like, what are we doing here? And I, I, you know, my parents retired and my, my brother and I are getting back on terms and, you know, I hadn't really had a lot of time for personal life, like a good amount I did, but I like wanted to take a pretty solid break. I kind of came to realize. So yeah, after the symposium, I kind of, um, you know, tried to part ways with the team and just kind of let people go and just, you know, give myself some time to do nothing. So I committed myself. I was like for three months, I don't want to do anything. You know, I just want to yeah. like enjoy my family, enjoy my friends, have a personal life, have other hobbies, you know, which is great. Thankfully shifts at a point where it's a little self-sustaining and I would like make new content here or there. And then the 10 year anniversary came up in September and I like, you know, had had a lot of time to think about like literally from a, a blog I wrote in 2013 about hip flexor stiffness to whatever this machine is that we have. So I was like, well, what, like, what would be a cool thing to do? So even I sat down for like maybe three hours, you know, my best friend and the person I ran the gym with and, you know, she ran the gym. I kind of helped out with as a, as she was head coach, but um, we just literally went down memory lane about like, like, what are the lessons we've learned? What are the things that have been cool? You know, what would we do differently? What were some big L's that I took? And I think that was in September, October. And I was kind of in the headspace of like, I don't want to do anything unless I'm really, really fired up to do it. You know, yeah. like when you're young running a business, you're uh, you're doing it because like you have to, right? You have to make ends meet. You have to do a lot of stuff you don't want to do. And, you know, the first three to five years were like that. And I think at this point, I'm kind of the where it's like, okay, what do I love doing? What's enjoyable? Mm -hmm that was what was fun. It's like, I'll sit down with Eva and like have a bunch of food and coffee and just like go down memory lane. And so, yeah, that was the seed for the book, right? Because I have so many in my notes app or my journal, I just have tons of like, like you probably, right? You just like yeah. write down, ideas, you think about things, you, you're in the shower and you think about like, damn, it's crazy yeah. to think, you know, this is something that happened 10 years ago. And this is what I'm doing now. So I had like the workings of the book floating around for probably like two years of, of scribbling notes. And then just like, you know, so many podcast episodes that I had like talked with people. And so, I think I was on a flight maybe somewhere and I just started to like scribble some ideas down or write some ideas down and put my laptop out. And then of course, like, you know, you have a three hour flight where no one's talking to you and you're ripped up on coffee and you're like excited. <laughs> so the, the outline kind of poured out a little faster than I thought, you know, I was like, Ooh, wait a minute. Like this is actually like a sustainable um, approach to this of, of like how it came out. So I shelved it, came back to it maybe a week later and then filled in some more. And then there was just one Friday I woke up and the same thing happened. Like, you know, I had a couple ideas, had a cup of coffee and just like, I looked back and I had a word document. I was like, oh, wow, that's like 
that's close. You know, that's like pretty yeah. close to it. Yeah, yeah. The book I wanted to write was like a daily stoic, do it like, you know, as you go exercises. I didn't want to just spit information to people. I wanted to hopefully offer really practical information about, you know, the cultural stuff. So yeah, long answer to your question, but that was the memory lane of like symposium led to some time off, led to um, talking with Eva, led to some some Friday mornings of an outline. And then, yeah, you just like kind of bury the hatchet for a couple of weeks and just, you know, cancel your schedule meetings and just go for it. Yeah, no doubt. So is the, um, is the symposium, is it hundred percent virtual? Yeah. Symposium was all virtual. So that's why it's wonderful because it's like literally people from GB from Australia could like be speakers. Um, it's awful because you are literally coordinating 20 to 25 lectures um, behind the scenes, running stuff, getting their presentations, getting their PDFs, setting up the back end, doing all the marketing. Like, so it's a blessing and a curse. I think it's, it's yeah. pros and cons of an in-person event, right? In-person is great. I love in-person events, but um, you can't just, you know, I, I personally can't just fly over 20 speakers from around the world and just budget. Right. Roll that whole thing. So, but you know, we had people pre-record their lectures ahead of time. So like, you know, Nick and Molly and other people who I think like are really stretched for time could find two hours or three hours to make it. And then another 45 minutes to record it. They send it up. They sent us the recording. And as soon as we have the recording, we edit it, put it up and people can see it. But then as soon as the event is done, like as soon as their lecture is done, we can publish the recording. So people could go back the exact same day and rewatch a lecture. They missed half. They have a kid thing. They couldn't make half the lectures. So that was the benefit is that we have literally all the recordings, all the PDFs, all the lectures ahead of time. Nobody had to write stuff down while they're doing it. No one had to do whatever. It was like, literally, they could just sit there and enjoy it. And, and then Nick and people could be in the chat answering questions live, right? You can't yeah. live and answer questions live at the same time. So people really like that part of it, which is why we chose to do that format again, because people were like, it was so cool to talk to Nick about the drills he was doing while I was watching a lecture from Nick, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 Do you ever want to do in person? Obviously, it's probably maybe something smaller at the beginning. Yeah. I don't know. Um, Sorry. Um, Nick and I have talked about doing a, a little smaller less than stand yeah. event, um, maybe like one in London and one in the US, like maybe like two weekends apart or something like that. Yeah. Because, you know, Nick had Gym Con, which was just like, that's like the Rolls Royce of conferences, right? That thing was insane and so good. And you have my version, which is more of like, I don't want to call it a bootstrap, but you know, I'm, I'm like a I want to I want to try to maximize the sitting at home for people and not having to go anywhere. And I think a lot of people appreciate if they have kids and stuff. And so somewhere in the middle of that would be a cool idea of getting, you know, a bunch of people together and making it very informal, casual. Like, I think I would like to do if I do a live event sometime in the future, it'd be really great to have a couple of people together with a partner in crime, but keep it like maybe a social event, a tie to it, you know, mm -hmm. like talk in the day, do some stuff, but then have like a nice little evening at night to kick it and chill and hang out with people. Maybe a two day event, something like that. I don't know. Like that'd be cool. Um, but the thought of an in-person organization, uh, makes me want to uh, put a pen through my eyes because it's so stressful. <laughs> so much liability, right? Online is like, of course there's liability and like you want to deliver a good product and stuff, but like, you don't have to rent a place and get insurance and like do all that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. 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 It would be fun. It would be fun. Yeah, I think it's probably, I mean, so I did a, a couple years, uh, mini live event, I guess would be the best way to put it is I, I think the biggest struggle for me um, was the marketing, the attendance, like selling tickets, yeah. right? Like getting totally. people to attend. I think that was, I think that was the biggest hurdle. Um, yeah. like, and, and I'm sure it is. It's a lot of that goes in of like, in two different years, it's like, I did it like, <laughs> I took different strategies. Like one year I made it like tickets were like, I don't know, like three or five dollars. Right. And then everyone was like, you know, people value price. Da, 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 da. So like the next year I made them like 25 and 30 dollars. It was like still yeah. the same. Like, all right, fuck, I'm missing something here. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing that's hard is that, you know, when I think about traveling somewhere for a conference, I instantly have to calculate flight, hotel, travel, food, miss time from the clinic, you know. So like the cost exponentially goes up because yeah. it's a live event. So that's the only thing that's hard. It's like the ticket price could be a hundred bucks, but then people have to get a hotel. They have to get food. They have to drive there. They got to take time off work. So that's what I personally think about. And so it, it's, it's harder for me to get to live in person stuff because of, you know, um, schedule commitments, you know, it's yeah. really hard to go to the clinic for four days when you have people who have surgery and who have whatever. So. Well, and I think too is, I think you kind of hit the nail on the hill, it, nail in the sense of, maybe this is just my personality, but I feel like people will jump at something no matter what the ticket price is from like a networking aspect. Like if they're going to meet a bunch of shit ton of really cool people or like, you know, just broaden their network, I think yeah. 
I mean, I don't know. That's like personal growth 101. <laughs> yeah. I think it depends on like what you're trying to get out of the event, right? Like if you're trying to get just pure information, like educational stuff, like when I take courses for PT and stuff, I will often buy the course, not take it live and listen to the recording on double speed because I can knock that out in a day. Yeah. Like I, I could be between like a couple car rides and sitting down for a morning. I could get through a six hour course on double speed very fast right yeah but if the goal is to network and meet people and hang out and kick it and you're not thinking about like the speed of consumption then a couple lectures here and there and then like you said like dinners hanging out going out and like kicking it um that's probably more where the value is and so i think it depends on like what the goal is to get out gym con for nick was very much great information but there was so much marketing networking hanging out so like the the glue of social interaction in person is kind of what i think he was he was a big part of what he was going for where i think my goal with this symposium was like how much insane value can I deliver in, in three days? You know, like how yeah. much jam information? Cause I want people to feel like they got value out of the weekend, but go like, we, we actually look at the records and like people go back and rewatch lectures two, three, four times. Like they're downloading the stuff. They're taking notes. Like that's what I want. I want like a mega between both symposiums. I mean, that's like 50 hours of, of pretty expert based uh, gymnastics information that I want people to have as like a hub to go back to. Yeah. Is it a, uh, um, like what's the word like credibility boost for you in the sense of do more people reach out to you? I don't know. Do people like reach out to you, like hire you personally. I know we talked about that a little bit last time. Like I know you go into some teams and stuff like that. Is that. Yeah. I mean, I guess I don't think about it in that lens of like the business marketing funnel hat. Yeah. Um, Shifts kind of had an inflection point um, just after the scandal broke and stuff where a lot of people were listening to the podcast and things were really popular and people on the website. So that was kind of the point of like critical mass where like, I feel like, most people in gymnastics had an idea about shift and I would get a lot more inquiries that way and work with teams and stuff like that. So yeah. I'm sure it helped for sure. I'm sure like more people ask questions and more people do, you know, reach out and stuff like that. But I would say since like 2000, probably since the pandemic, I would say I've had a consistent consulting book of people who I like touch base with here and there and have like college teams or club teams or whatever yeah. that I work. You know, I, I'm personally like not a you know, you have to sign a three month contract and we're meeting every two weeks. Like that's not where my consulting work has gone right now. I just like being accessible and available to people who want help. You know what I mean? So like yeah. I've never charged a, an absurd consulting fee. I never really understood charging five to $10,000 just to talk to me. Like, I think that's kind of like weird. Um, but you know, I'll just cover, it's usually the same hourly rate that I would miss from doing work on my own. So I just tell people like, yo, I'm here. If we've worked together before and you want to chat and like set up a call, that's cool. Let's just do it. So yeah, I don't know. I just, maybe I'm like not doing that right and losing a lot of money. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I just don't like that approach to gatekeeping myself with this absurd $5,000. Yeah. Back. Well, what's your thought on this? Cause this is the way that like, this is the way that I approach it too is, okay. So like, if I'm going to sit down with you, I don't know, like, Yes, I'm going to get a lot of value in one conversation, but I don't know that it's going to stick, right? Yeah. It's like, I always think it's like, I got to keep it here, right? It's the 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 mentors that I've had, I've hired them for anywhere from like four months to 12 months in that range yeah. to be able to kind of like yeah. keep that accountability. And so it's yeah. like, even like when I go in, I try to approach it of, of like, I kind of outprice like the one-off thing because I don't sure. want that in the sense of, of like, I don't want you to pay me $5,000 to come in and talk to your team one time. And they're like, ah, and then like two days later, they're like, they don't even remember my name. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I feel the same way. I think usually the upfront discussion and cost is like, I'm always a people believe what you do, not what you say kind of person. So like, if I work with a team for the first time, of course, I would like them to cover my flight in my hotel and like, you know, you know, not you know, make me lose money by going there. But right. at the same time, like, I'd rather just keep it like a lower entry cost. And then we have a relationship for the rest of whatever, like, and that's how like PT works in the clinic, like a champion, we do zero marketing, like besides like social media posts here and there, like, in terms of like attracting clients or like getting people like top of the funnel for PT, my entire caseload right now is referral is from like a friend of a teammate, yeah. a friend, I treat like whole families over the course of a year. So I've always been a, a believer. And this was the, like with shift and the clinic is like, if you do a good job and you're nice, most people remember that and they trickle down. So like all the colleges that I've worked with or all the people that I work with now or past are just like, I met them out and they had a good experience or they saw me lecture and then asked me after, or like somebody, you know, I work with one team and then another team had a similar problem. And so the coach said like, Hey, well, we work with Dave and like that helped out a bit. So like, yeah, I don't know. I'm a big, like with, with over, you know, like super, I'd, I'd rather work with a handful of teams throughout multiple years 
and try to help the best I can as things come up than like commit to like one like season working with one team. You know what I mean? Because I yeah. just feel like that's not that's not my role in the ecosystem of gymnastics is to be like a, you know, I thought about working for a college for a while. Like what if I just go to a college, teach in the PT department and work with the team? That'd be cool. It'd be really fun. But I feel like, I don't know. I feel like to make the most impact and keep it interesting, you don't want to, you don't want to marry yourself to one, one organization personally. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I feel that. And I think too is I totally agree is I think for me, just personally too, and maybe I've just been like, fortunate like knock on wood it's like the teams that like I've been around those staffs and coaches have been like super receptive of, of like yeah. like yeah. I'll help you out in any way I can like if anybody ever has any questions like I mean if they need totally. my number just like like tell them to call totally. me like I'll totally vouch for you right it's not like the because I've been in that when I had like the strength and conditioning facility like there's certain parents that would like come in and like not tell other right. kids parents because like that was their right, secret right. sauce right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and the other thing that's cool too is you know there's um just like things that are coming to mind is i think given the fact that like myself and ellen like create research and we write research and we conduct studies and stuff like that like it's very important to be a little detached so you can look at patterns across the entire sport so like the papers we've we have two workload papers in progress right now and then a couple we've submitted but like that only that that the new insight we got from those articles only came because we reached with across multiple programs, right? We studied a bunch of programs and the fact that the, the ability for us to have those relationships and do those papers or do that work came from the years of consulting work and the years of traveling and talking to people for like, you know, not a, not a business exchange kind of thing. So I think it's really important to be able to be a provider who's a little bit detached because I can try to look between four or five different programs or analyze stuff or have stuff going on versus you know, when you're with one program or when you're mainly doing studies or research or talking to one program, you know, it's good or bad. It's one type of philosophy. It's one system. It's it's one data set. It's the continual program that you're taking kids from versus, you know, the, the study that's in publication now I can't talk about, but like we looked at four different D1 schools for our workload stuff. And so when we compare like four different programs, it's very, it's got much more effect size and power because, you know, those individual programs are all silos. And so when there's a pattern across all of them, it's much more powerful. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I think it makes you a better coach too, because you have so much, you have so many different perspectives, right? Like I know, like for me, it's like talking with these people, talking with these people, talking with these people. It's like, oh, like that helps me understand this over here so that I can help right. them. Right. And I don't have to give names or anything like that. It's just like in my yeah. brain. I'm like, I'm not like, but I would have never seen that. Like you said, if I didn't have, you know, Correct. to be able and to. And to your point too, which is that one of the, I'll just be transparent and say one of the things that's been um, a, a decider of me taking a little bit of a break is it's very exhausting over 10 years to keep working on the same problems and trying to help make positive change and, and maybe feeling like you're stuck in the mud a bit. So um, I think one of the things that does consistently seem to help with changes stick is when you talk about global issues, when you talk yeah. about like, I've, I've like, you know, gone to conferences where I've talked to like maybe the college coaches or whatever. And I can say like, listen, like I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. Like, you know what I mean? This is like seen across all of your programs. Like, this is not a you problem. This is not like a, a, a an issue that someone is doing wrong. This is like very much a systemic problem in the sport. Like, I remember talking to those coaches, like uh, all the NCAA coaches about uh, Achilles tears, you know, when those, those few years when they were really bumping up quite a bit. And, um, you know, everybody would reach out to me when, like, when someone got hurt and say, what are we doing wrong? And I had the ability to say like, well, actually like you're one of seven programs I'm talking with. Everyone is struggling with this. So like we're, we're trying to see a solution, but like, it's not, you're doing something wrong. This is the sport issue. Then you, then you can kind of like take some air cover for them and be like, you're not doing anything wrong, but it also gives me maybe the, I don't know, the agility to go to their conference and like talk to literally a hundred of them and say, listen guys, the season is too dense. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I know you think it's the yeah. spring floor, you think it's this, but like a problem we have here is that like you're doing 14 meets back to back to back to back. And these kids have maybe done one, two meets a month for their entire career, right? And they come to college freshman year. They don't have a summer that's as intense. They come into the preseason, new school, new life, new social stuff, new training program. They're lifting for the first time, which they should have started when they were kids, right? And then they go 14 weeks in a row. Like, of course, something's going to go wrong, right? So like, I know you want to, uh, and not to say it isn't tumbling technique or whatever, but like, I know you want to blame a spring floor company or like this type of back handspring, but like, low hanging fruit. <laughs> Maybe it's like strength conditioning and insane workload spikes. Like let's start with those 
right? But a lot, again, I can say that to the entire organization of club coaches or elite coaches or college coaches because you see it across the entire program. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think you can even go a step further than that of, and this is kind of like, I guess the world that I live in a little bit too, is how much stress, anxiety, emotional issues affect those things too. It's like, um, you know, I posted something the other day. It's like a we I had hired a research company to like find all these trends for me. So I didn't have to like do the work. Yeah, and it yeah. was like, I think, I think it was, this was specifically for the sport of like football, but I think it's, again, I think it's across the board. It was like, there's like 3.2 times the amount of energies injuries during like midterms and exam weeks than yeah. any other time. Right. It's just, it's, it's a stress thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the studies from uh, Yale that talked about this? There were some crazy studies. Of no. Yale. Long story short, not to waste time, but essentially they, they looked at the correlation between physical stressors and emotional stressors on uh, physical recovery. So I want to say in both, they did it with, um, I don't know whether it was rats first or human seconds, but like essentially they had the students um, do max effort leg presses to like, like I think it was like eight by 10 at their eccentric overload at 80% max. So like enough to get like horrific doms, like really, really bad doms. And uh, they then asked those students to give us a scale of index of how stressful like life events are, school, family, um, all the things that are kind of validated as like psychological stressors or life stressors. And essentially the, the kids all got fatigued to the DOMS protocol, but the ones who had, I think like two or three more significant life stressors, it took them an extra 48 hours to recover from the DOMS. Yeah. And, and they measured that in terms of uh, muscle soreness and uh, bike power output. And so the, you know, the, the TLDR of that study is essentially, if you're, you have more life stress, you have more uh, elongated recovery time from physical activity. The mouse study they did, they repeated this. It's hilarious to think about. They put a little mouse inside of a, uh, you know, an eccentric calf machine and made yeah. it do calf machine things. But then essentially they stressed the mouse with, um, I forget what type of psychological stress. It might have been like a water swim test. And did the same thing to look at the biological mechanisms because they, you know, the rat would pass away. They would then look at the brain and then do whatever. And essentially the same hormone system and adrenal stress gland systems that are working on the psychological stressors is the same type of biological molecule as the physical recovery stressors. So when you're psychologically stressed, it is negatively impacting the physical stress recovery. And the big picture of that is that like very stressed college students, right? Thinking about Yale, the study was done at right, very right. stressed <laughs> out college students or high school students or kids, right? who are massively stressed with school, they're not sleeping, they're, they're worried about their meats. The theory is that that's negatively impacting their physical recovery from exercise. Totally. So that's that I just thought that study was fascinating, right? Because like, if you think about obviously less sleep, maybe nutrition is not great, and they're psychologically stressed, they're probably not going to recover as well from physical exercise. So there's the part of you need good workload programming, you need good strength and conditioning, you need good, you know, technical training to get somebody prepped. But also, it's really important to talk to these kids about, you know, sleeping and managing their stress and, you know, having time to watch Netflix during the week. Like, I went to a very prestigious high level university with a gymnastics team. And my half, my conversation with them was like, yo, like, it's okay to watch Netflix for an hour to turn your brain off and like not think about gymnastics and not think about school, that was more anxiety provoking for them than me telling them to do more strength and conditioning. They're like, oh, I can't yeah. take an hour off. Like there's no, I, I gotta go. I gotta grind. I'm like, yeah, but like your brain needs detachment. You need psychological recovery. You need to refill the gas tank uh, from a stress, like adrenal hormonal point of view. And uh, yeah, I'm still fascinated by that stuff. The workload stuff is, is very much based in that for me, but like hardcore type A young kids in college gymnasts need time to detach and unwind and do stuff that's not gymnastics related and it's good data that it might be very significantly correlated to like physical readiness and physical recovery totally totally and i think it's like for me too i think a, a large part of like my role it directly ties into that is just like talk to them obviously we talk about gym and sports and things like that but like talk to them about things outside of that that just are yeah. meaningful to them that they don't feel like anybody else will like listen to it's like i it, most of them laugh at me like across the board and every, like all the teams it's like the moment i come in like i the first question i ask them and it's not a judgment question i know that like first time they meet me they're like uh is this a test but i'm just like I'm like hey like what like what'd you eat for dinner last night and they're like yeah oh, like what did i like and then i can't even remember i'm like dude like yeah but it's an icebreaker of, of just yeah. like i'm not here to like I was practice yeah. yesterday, like, oh, like <laughs> music, music and Netflix shows are my go-to yeah. icebreaker 
for us to build it, right? It's like universal for everybody. And and back to like the book is like the book for the culture thing that I wrote was very much like people want technical solutions, right? They want like fix the round off, give me the best plyo drills, uh, how many bar routines should I do, all that kind of stuff. And 95% of the time, my entire last 10 years of consulting with colleges, clubs, elite, national teams, whatever, that is not the problem. <laughs> like yeah. that is not the problem, right? You have to go all the way back to figure out like, okay, what else could be an issue underneath that? And then people will backtrack once and they'll be like, it's more of a cultural problem. Like, but the, they say it in the lens of like, everybody else is doing something wrong. The kids aren't working hard enough. The parents are too dramatic. Everybody is not showing up to practice. They're not mentally tough enough. They're not working hard enough. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. Anything else you could think about maybe there? And like, they get back to like, okay, well, maybe there's some personal development level things, right? Because every culture is just a, 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 pr as a product of a bunch of human individuals, right? And so- Yes, I agree. Getting information on drills and technique and stuff is amazing. Don't get me wrong. I agree that creating a culture of, you know, trust and hard work and rapport and stuff like that is really important. But at the end of the day, the individual person only controls themselves and what they bring to the culture, right? So like, you have to actually take a huge step back and deal with your own shit first. Like that yeah. is the that is the hard, tough reality of coaching in general, but also gymnastics specifically in the last 10 years. And I can say this because I've literally walked through the furnace of this journey of having the biggest ego ever and thinking I was the shit and then getting completely humbled and being like almost like fall into a crash of despair from the ivory tower and realizing how much of a douche I was being, frankly, right, to the kids that I work with because I yeah. had personal baggage problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I tried my best politely in the book to say like, you have to start with like, why are you coaching? What do you care about? Like, what are your own insecurities? What are your own fears? Like, are you dragging personal life drama into the gym? Are you not healthy? Are you not happy with the way that you look or feel or how much money you're making or whatever? Like, that is the ground level of any successful national team or any successful college. I promise you, the best coaches I work with, they individually, they they don't need gymnastics to be happy, right? Yeah. They're, they're on their own and they're doing gymnastics because they love it and they want to help the kids. So the book is like very much starting from there and fixing that. But in the middle, when you go to cultural stuff, back to your point is uh, Daniel, I think Konya is his name. It's called the uh, the Culture Cure or the Culture yeah. Code. Code, yeah. It's like micro events are how the glue is created for highly performing teams. So SEALs or, you know, NBA teams or Google, for example, very three different organizations. You have more of like the hardcore brass tax military. You have like the sporting NBA. Then you have like the more like kind of tech dork like me, right? Which is more like that all three of them have ways to interact with like micro events. So like those small passing comments, like how was your night? What are you watching on Netflix? What shows do you like? You know, like what music's on your, on your vibe right now? Like, Hey, I heard your brother was going through something. How's he doing? Like nothing related to, you know, the mission or, you know, the, the plays we're going to run next game or the, the, the project we're working on, but human level social interactions make like the glue in the fabric and Google did a study where they found out what that's doing is creating psychological safety. So mm -hmm. when you feel that people have your back around you and you can say anything or bring up ideas without getting uh, you know, made fun of, frankly, um, that creates like a bedrock of trust, which then like performance is built on top of. And so that's what I tried my best in, in the book to summarize, like the best teams I work with do their own personal level stuff first. They figure their life out. They're very good. They bring the best version of themselves that's constantly trying to improve to the culture. And by creating micro events, by caring about each other, by having human level interactions, trust, rapport, communicating well, having empathy, that is like like literally the entire base of high performing clubs and elite teams and national teams that are consistently doing well is because they know that human level values are taken care of. And then on top of that, you have bandwidth to create technical level things like working hard on strength and conditioning and doing a bunch of drills and grinding six days in a row and giving up your entire like you know social life not entire but a lot of your social yeah. life to compete well in season that's that middle level of what people talk about and that allows for performance-based stuff of drills and skills and all that kind of stuff so yeah it's very much like that's how i view the funnel of highly successful cultures and how to repair toxic ones yeah 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 and i think from a i see it in in two different aspects one from coaches just to like piggyback off of like what you were saying too and then two people like in my industry as well is I think the big mistake that they make is one coaches are like vulnerability is the word right but they're basically scared to say like 
I was a terrible coach at one time, or maybe I was a terrible athlete. And like, I had to like go on this journey and like figure this thing out. Or like people in my industry, it's like they get in front of a team for the first time and they're like, dude, I've worked with this fucking national champion. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And these kids sit across and they're like, I don't give a shit. Versus like, yeah. I go in, I'm like, dude, like I was depressed. And I thought about killing myself in college because like, I didn't know who I was and like all this and blah, 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 blah. And they're like, that guy right like yeah. not everybody yeah. like i get it i don't i don't i don't yeah. i don't vibe with everybody and i don't i don't pretend to yeah to nor nor that. is that your opening line <laughs> yeah right right yeah yeah <laughs> to your point though man like wh what is that because i've gone through this like what is the what is the reason why people don't want to uh admit that they're they weren't a great coach or they had more to learn or that they need help like the biggest thing it's insecurity it's really totally. insecurity right totally. it's insecurity and the base of that is fear right like that's that's what it all comes down to we're all humans we all have amygdalas, right? All of it is fear of social judgment and social pressure or internally when you admit that you, you know, did something wrong or did whatever, it hurts. It's not fun, bro. It's like not enjoyable at all. So th that is the process of getting through it is like, you have to get down to like, what are your root level fears? And mine were like insecurities about like, you know, not being smart enough or like not looking a certain way because I grew up in like a male dominated gymnastics culture. And so like, I propped myself up on like, Oh, I'm smart. And that's my value as a coach, right? It's yeah. like I'm smart. I'm a nerd and whatever. And so when somebody steps out of the way and says like, well, maybe you're not right on this, or what do you think about this? It would, it would be a massive insecurity trigger. Right. So that really is what people come down to. And I think it's, it's, it's helpful though, because when you realize, I don't think it excuses the behavior. Let me be fair about that. But like when you see somebody at a meet who is yelling at a judge or who is like upset with their kids or a parent who's going off and like yelling at the judge or whatever, like, I don't know, you develop like this sense of empathy, like, oh, man, like, you're just like, really hurting inside, right? Like, for you to yell at a seven year old, like, shit's not good, man. Like, you're right, going right, through, right. Stuff, right? So I'm, I, I don't excuse the behavior. And I, I try my best to call it out or tell people like, that's not acceptable. But on the back lens of that is like, like, that person is deeply hurting inside, right? Like, and I, I noticed this very acutely when I, you know, the first start of when shift was doing popular, I fortunately got access to like some inner circles, maybe you would say, you know, around the world and stuff like that. And sometimes you get close and you just see people for really who they are, you know, and you mm -hmm. see like, you know, how many drinks they're inhaling after a meet at the bar and how much they talk about how amazing they are. And they want that praise. They want that clap. They want that whatever. And then, I don't know, you just see a different human level of them, right? You can like very much see the pain behind someone's eyes sometimes. Like they're kind of like a ghost in a shell that when you take away the podium and the meets and the lights and all the makeup and all the leotards and all the whatever. It's just them by themselves. Like they're not happy. You know, they're really not exactly happy with their life and they need gymnastics. They need the girl's performance, the guy's performance to feel good about themselves. And like, that's like a deeply empathetic moment for me. I'm like, Oh man, like you're hurting. Like I, I think you should take some time to really sort out what makes you happy outside of gymnastics and let's drink a little less. Let's work out a little more. Let's, let's journal. Let's go to therapy. Like let's figure this out. Cause like, this is not healthy right now. So the closer I got, not everybody, right? For sure. There are the right. vast majority of people that I met at that level were actually amazing and they're wonderful. And again, because they're so good, they can help the kids be them best selves. But there were a lot of moments with like individuals where I like look up to my entire life. And then I saw them one-to-one -one having coffee, just me and them, no phones, no whatever. And I was like, Ooh, like, I, I get it. You know, like I'm, 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 I'm sorry that you're going through this, but like, I understand I don't excuse it and it's not okay but I understand why you boil over and scream or yell when something doesn't go right in the gym and you're frustrated. So you can be passionate about your job without being attached to your job for self-worth. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too is a lot of, and this is like 30,000 foot view of like core message with honestly, like staff and like teams is I always say, and I think this is very lost especially in the like goal setting world of, of like i i forget where i heard this so i like i can't take credit for it but like i definitely like this is my core message i always say it's like you don't get what you want you get who you are so like mm. you can write down all the things that you want i literally went into a team uh recently and like my opening line i was like okay hey we're gonna do an activity i was like you got 60 seconds write on this piece of paper everything that you want they're like in gym i'm like i in everything right and so 60 seconds later, I was like, good, crumble that piece of paper up and throw it on the floor. And they were like, why? I was like, because you don't get that just because you want it. You get it. Yeah. You get who you are as a person. So if you want more than like, that's the core message. We have to have a transformation in identity. That's that. ultimately is where we're going to go. And I think it's the same for coaches. It's like you said, it's like they're blaming all the things. But at some point, like if you want more, like you have to change, like you have to like, yeah. it's the trickle down theory, right? Like, and they are the top domino at the top. Totally. And I think another 
big aha moment I had in my own kind of personal development career, or whatever, and I've seen a lot of other people is 90% of people reach out to me and talk to me after something has gone wrong when they're right. not happy with the results, right? So I call those emotional catalysts is that I don't think, unfortunately, people will truly change until they have an emotional catalyst that is painful and causes them to want to change, right? So in my own coaching career, it was like just like literally getting messages and emails and letters from kids that I coached that I was like, they don't want to work out with me. I'm too mean. I'm I'm not fun at all. Like I'm picking favorites. Like that was deeply painful for me. And it caused me to have to do some self-reflection, but everybody has those moments in their lives where maybe they wake up one day and they're not happy with their job or their career, or how they look or how they feel. And it doesn't feel good. So they want to change it. And many teams go through that too, which is like you, you grind off preseason, you do this big, and then like Three people get hurt. You don't make it there to the championship and you like lose in the first round. Right. And then like they reach out to me and they're like, yeah, we're doing something wrong. You know, the whole team was kind of deflated and we don't want this to happen again. So the reason I say that is I think intuitively or reflexively when something is painful or uncomfortable, I think discomfort is the better word, not pain. I think pain is a different line. I think discomfort is probably yeah. where you want to be. You need to lean into that and do some surgical extraction. Right. So like in the beginning, it's raw, right? It hurts. It's really painful. You don't want to talk about it probably in the first week after you just, you know, drop the ball on this giant goal you had or whatever, or something really tough happened. Like give yourself some time to step away, take care of yourself, do what you need to do to get in a good headspace, sleep a lot, you know, take care of yourself, go and hang out with friends, whatever. But then after like a week or so, you got to block your schedule off and do like a, an autopsy on, you know, what didn't go well and why, and lean into some of those really uncomfortable thoughts you have about like, what you're saying to yourself or what's going on. The only way you will not repeat the exact same misery in a different fashion or a different code is if you spend time to autopsy that. And so whether you're a program and you're going through a bad season, personally, you're going through like a, it was a really tough breakup or you, you know, like something happened where you had a bout of depression or you got really anxious or something like you have to spend time professionally on your own to go through and dig through the weeds there and kind of look at the the wreckage and, and figure out what can be done. Like that's the only way that you have the momentum to move forward is when you have some of that emotional catalyst, I would say, you know, how many, uh, coaches, staffs, clubs, high level people, because hundred percent agree is I think the hardest part is for people to actually be honest about like their current situation. So as the analogy I always give is, um, I always say like, like if you're going to travel somewhere and you're going to punch something into Google maps, I was like, what's the first thing that you have to say? And everybody's like, your destination. I'm like, no, that's the problem. I was like, it has to know your current location. If it doesn't uh, know your yeah. current location, that's the top bar. And then the destination is the second bar. And they're like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. I'm like, you guys are just like writing down again, what you want and all the things over here. But like you yeah. haven't, like you said, done the autopsy on like, as I would say, it's like, who am I right now? Like, why is shit not working out? <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that it's really hard for people to do that in a group setting if they yeah. don't have that trust that rapport because it's, you know, social uh, rejection and or social whatever, you know, whether you're getting, you ask a girl out or you ask a boy out and they say no and they get ghosted or whatever, or it's like literally you're in a team full of like a staff you work with and someone's consistently shitting on your ideas and doesn't let you have your freedom to talk. That feels deeply painful because that's really important to us as a species. So it's really hard for people to do that in a group setting, right? I would argue it's even harder for someone to do by themselves, right? So mm. like your idea of writing something up, crumpling it down. I had this exercise in the book called One to Burn, which is like, I bet there's like two or three thoughts in your head or things you think about that when they come up in your head, you're like, oh God, I don't like that. Like, like, yeah, like that. I, I don't like that about myself. Like, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to even talk about that. I don't want to think about the idea that I have a, you know, uh, a drinking problem or that I have like a, I'm addicted to social media or that, you know, I'm neglecting my workouts and I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not healthy the way I want. Like, I don't, I don't want to think about it because it's like, it makes me uncomfortable. Like you have to get to the point where you can either through therapy or on your own, like literally get that stuff out onto paper or wherever. And like, that is the first step, right? Cause like when you're by yourself and you're writing or you're talking to a therapist, there's like nowhere to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, <laughs> so I often found that some of the hardest conversations were me with myself because I was like a little bit like shuddered by the fact that I, I thought that way, or that was me, or I had some vices that were not healthy for me. So like there were many times when like literally I would write down these things on a piece of paper. It was hard. And then I would literally light it on fire and throw it away because I, like, I got to burn the evidence, man. But like, at least it's out. It's like, we yeah. got somewhere, right? You have to start with the, what things are floating through your head that you're probably scared to even think about our problems as vices or insecurities or fears work through those friends, therapy, journaling, whatever. And then it allows you the the comfort level to be good with yourself and start to tackle, you know, team level problems and 
it's easier to have conversations with other people around hard topics um, when you know their kind of discomforts and fears and security, you can tread around those a little bit lightly. Oftentimes when you, when you bring up a topic or a discussion, like in a, in a team setting, I've been on like, you know, meetings or in person where, you know, the real problem, we all know the real problem. Yeah. Everyone knows. The real problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> like everyone knows, like, it's like, but we talk about random other problems that are not, but I'm like, all right, like at some point in this meeting, we'll get to the real issue. And then we do get to the real issue, right? Like, Oh, the strength coach and the uh, actual coach, um don't agree on how many plows we should do and the head coach doesn't know a lot about strength and conditioning and so there's this tug of war right and it's like yeah. oh all right, here we go like now now we're getting there and now what happens is insecurities are triggered like oh i don't know enough or like i'm not smart enough as a coach mm. whatever and that's where the tension start to boil and you have to be able to eggshell around those a little bit carefully because that's that's where nerves are hit and so but that only that only come those conversations can only happen when people are secure with themselves and understand who they are yeah. And I think it's okay. Like, well, twofold is I think it's okay to admit if you don't know, right. Like yep. if there, if there's something that comes up instead of like pretending insecurity, right. Like you're the smartest person in the room or it's funny. Um, God, this probably, I probably was in, I probably was in high school and, um, uh, I learned this from like my granddad in, in like business and sales or whatever. And he was just like, you know, it's the idea of like never lie to a client. He's like, if you don't know, he's like, at some point, like, it's okay to be like, hey, I actually don't know to that. But like, by the end of the day, like, I'm going to get back to you. Like, I'm going to go find an answer and I'm going to get back, make sure to get back to you. He's like, that, like, people will value that from you versus like yeah. you spewing a bunch of bullshit to where it's like, now they're more confused. Totally. Yeah. And I, I fell on my own sword 100% with that. That was me as a younger coach of not being able to admit, I don't know something, I need help. And I think people's perception is that the higher you go in the rank, so to speak, whether you're like a club coach who becomes a regular coach, who starts to work with a college who works on national team, whatever, the thought is that the higher you go, the more you know, the more expertise you have. So the less you have to ask people for help. And you're like the guru, the God who like, you know, has every magical correction for why this your tranko is not going well. And in my experience, you get to a point where that forks pretty significantly, where like you get to this critical mass of like maybe, you know, collegiate or national level uh, competition or in the non gymnastics world, like semi pro level. And then it trickles off there. It's a leveling effect. The ones who consistently take the path of no, I know everything. I don't need help. I can figure this out. I just got to work harder. I got to be mentally tough. They kind of like rocket ship up and they like just piddle out and they become like the same plateaued, kind of not average, but kind of not really, really good. The coaches and the athletes and the people that I've worked with that continue to excel through that ceiling and make it more and more and more and more and more. They're actually, it's an inverse correlation for humility and learning, right? So like I, some of the coaches I respect the most who had like unbelievable level of success at the junior and like just the tip of the senior level on, on gymnastics, um, as they got more successful, quote unquote, they asked more questions. They found more mentors. They were always open to more. They were open to me saying you should lift weights, right? Instead of just doing bodyweight conditioning, like they continually have this like learning mindset. And then you get to like talk to them at the highest level. Like Nick's a great example. Nick, I would argue has some of the most technical gymnastics knowledge on the entire planet, right? He knows so much about technique and skills from basics to intermediate and advanced. But when he gets to the point of like something really advanced, he's like, I'll learn from anybody. I'm always open for new techniques. I'm always open to have my ideas challenged, right? He's constantly fluid. And some of the people who I, on the other side of respect, there are some coaches, very high level, have had gold medal Olympians. And I would meet with them uh, at camps, either through choice or through somebody brought me in and said, hey, we should listen. And I actually really thought, I was like, dude, there is no way this person gives a shit what I think. Like, yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. way. Yeah. And this person gives zero shits what I think about weight training or workload management. And they literally have gold medals lined up the, the world and Olympic champions. And uh, they were open to it. And like, they were actually the person who leaned in. It was like, interesting. Like, I didn't know this could help with injuries. I didn't know this could help with power or rate of force development or whatever. And I was like, damn, all right. You know, like I was really surprised by that to be fair. Um, but again, you can, even within those pods uh, at that level, you can see the ones who sit on the block and throw their side eye to you and say, like, yeah, yeah, do whatever he says, but we're not doing this at home. You know, and then you see the people who are like leaning into it and, you know, it's, it's consistently why the people who are open-minded and learn a lot have one, two, four, five generations of national team members. And, you know, others have one, one, <laughs> one, <Yeah. laughs> you know I mean? not to, not to throw shade, but like, I don't know, like you can kind of see, people who are open-minded and have that humility to learn, but also have an expertise on their own 
tend to be the ones that are catching the flywheel positively for a whole career. Yeah. Two pieces. And then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, one, it, it's funny when I very first started like reaching out, it was all the teams that I didn't think would respond back or set up a phone call with me because yeah. they were such hot. They were already like a high level achieving teams. They were the ones that were like quickest yeah. um, to respond. Get. And not all of them even like decided to work with me or hire me or whatever, but it was the fact that they're like, okay, like, yeah, tell me about what this, because they didn't want to miss an opportunity, right? Yes. It was like, yeah. let me just see, test the waters and see if this fits for our program. Some yes, some no. Um, interesting too is um, I just talked to last week, two weeks ago, um, Missouri wrestling coach, uh, they're ranked like number two in the country. And we were talking about recruiting and he's like the number one recruiting thing I do he, he he said the number one recruiting piece on a visit for him is if they ask questions. He said he's yeah. the associate coach. He was like the head coach is like if they ask questions, like if I'm gonna go show you the weight room or anything, his exact words, and you don't ask about like what's in it or what do y'all do in there. He's like, like you're all probably not gonna get in like yeah. offered here. He's like, the idea yeah. is, is like because of that, is because once you get here, it's like you have to stay curious. Correct. To understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the good, maybe the summary here to finish up is it's not by accident that these programs have a positive flywheel of that. They attract and they hire and they recruit personalities that have these characteristics, right? So the programs that I've worked with that are consistently in the higher tiers of top 10 or whatever, they high, the head coach is someone who got there because they were curious and they wanted to learn and they were good at their craft, right? Because they learned so much, they spent time grinding and learning, but they hire people who aren't like-minded in personality. They're actually very right. different personality yeah. wise, but they share human level, kindness, trust, respect. You know, they care about their job, they, but they have a growth mindset they want to learn. So they then recruit and hire people for their coaching staff that share that open-mindedness. Let's critique each other's ideas professionally and respectfully and honestly, and then, of course, they want kids on their team who are in high school who have that same mentality of, yeah, just because you did elite level gymnastics and you were there, like you can't not learn more. There's more to learn yeah. on all this kind of stuff. So then they recruit people who are like that. And that ecosystem becomes one of a constant update, critique, think out loud ideas, right? And that is the culture that is the one who's going to reach out to you or I first, right? Like some of the teams that I thought would never reach out to me because they literally are national champions. And they like, we got this figured out, man. Like we're knocking this out year over year. They were the first ones to reach out when we would publish research and be like, well, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. Like, what can we do in our program to help out with that? And then again, the teams that struggle and kind of are puttering at the mid level, if we remove resources, and obviously I know some of those high level programs have a budget that is absurd compared to some of the new programs, but the newer programs that have these banner two, three, four years are also like-minded in personality and growth traits than the ones that are at the top, right? And it's not an accident. So there's been a couple of teams that have just like stellar few years and they came out of the woodwork, right? Not by accident, because again, like, what can we learn? What can we yeah. do? What do we get better at? Who can we find, right? Is it a strength coach? Is it a mental health professional? Is it a, a you know, a sports performance and dietitian type of thing? Like, the, again, they're autopsying the, the root level problems they have and they're willing to find people who are experts in that field to complement their skill set. Yeah. And then it just like, if you're a coach, it takes stress off your plate because <laughs> you don't oh my have God, to worry yeah. about it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> be like, spend more time coaching gymnastics that you love and not worrying about, you know, having to figure out the proper set and rep range for deadlifting in the off season. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Well, cool, man. Um, I appreciate the jam session again. Um, shit, we'll have to do it again sometime. Do it, man. Let's book right. it for another. <laughs> appreciate you, man. Cheers, man. Peace.